When the Buddha describes the different factors of the path and their role in the practice, he says that mindfulness should be the governing principle. And he explains that by saying that you're mindful to give rise to skillful qualities, and when they're there, you're mindful to keep them going so they can develop. In other words, you don't simply see things arise and pass away, arise and pass away, and think you see them happening on their own. You actually try to, try to give rise to skillful things and try to prevent them from passing away. Because after all, there's nothing in the six senses, things that we know through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, that isn't the result of a process of fabrication. Everything we experience in these senses is fabricated. The only unfabricated thing there is is nirvana, which is outside of the six senses. So when people say they're simply watching things happening on their own, on their own, they don't really understand. Because what's happening is a result of past actions and your present actions. And if you think it's happening on your own, that means you don't know what your past actions were, you don't know what your present actions are. And if you don't know these things, there's no way you can get past this process of fabrication. What they call sankhara in Pali. The only way is to try to create a path, which is precisely what the Buddha recommends, that you use the process of fabrication to make something good. And in the effort to do that, you'll find out which things are coming in from the past that you can't change and which things are coming from your present actions that you can. This is why we have to put effort into the practice. Concentration doesn't happen on its own. It's something you have to put together. In the same way that unskillful qualities, even though they may eventually run out, you don't want to just sit there and say when greed or anger has taken control of the mind and just simply wait for it to end. The Buddha says you have to act like someone whose head is on fire. These things come in, you have to put out the fire, and everything else has to be put aside for the time being, because you've got to focus on that one thing. You've got this fire in your head, you've got to put it out. So when you're thinking in the terms of the Buddha's analogy of the practice as being like a fortress, there are times when the gatekeeper mindfulness has a lapse. And remember, the duty of mindfulness is to the duty of the gatekeeper is to recognize who's a friend, who's an enemy. Let the friends in, keep the enemies out. Well, every now and then mindfulness sl slips and the enemies come in. In other words, unskillful qualities take hold of the mind. And that's when you've got to use your effort, right effort, or your persistence, to get those things out of the fortress. Now, persistence requires two things. One is the desire to do this. You have to want to put an end to suffering for it to happen. It's not going to happen on its own. And then secondly, it needs knowledge so that your efforts are rightly directed. You understand what the enemy is like, where the enemy's weak points are, how to take the enemy apart, and how to create a stronger fortress, how to give your mindfulness a better foundation so that it will be less likely to lapse. This is why we listen to the Dharma, read the Dharma. And one of the things we learn is how this process of fabrication happens in the present moment. The Buddha says there are three kinds. There's bodily fabrication, which is the breath. Verbal fabrication, which is directed thought and evaluation, in other words, the way you talk to yourself. And there's mental fabrication, which are perceptions, the labels you have for things. And then feelings, feelings of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. 
Every mental state is composed of these three things. So when something unskillful comes in, say for instance, ill will comes in, there's somebody out there you want to see suffer, but then you realize that this is unskillful. Yet it's taken control of part of your mind. You have to take it apart. Ask yourself, how are you breathing around that topic? Can you breathe in a more comfortable way, more calm way? So at the very least, the ill will doesn't get into the body. And then you ask yourself how you're talking about it, the issue. This person that you have ill will for, are they totally bad? Try to see if you can think of some good points that the person has. If you think of the good po points, then it's harder to feel ill will. If you can't think of any good points at all, then the Buddha says, try to have some compassion for that person. I mean, people who have no good points at all are just digging themselves deeper and deeper into a hole. So the right attitude is to have compassion, to feel sorry for them. You don't get anything from seeing other people suffer. Or if you do gain something, it's pretty miserable. And then finally you look at your perceptions around the issue. What kind of monster do you see this person as? Do you see the person as a devious snake, or do you see them as a spider, as poisonous? What's the perception that's holding that ill will in your mind? And usually the, you'll find that there's a feeling of pain that goes along with this. So if you can breathe in a way that's more pleasurable, that undercuts the pain. And if you can learn to think to yourself, talk to yourself in new ways about the issue, you can weaken the ill will so it doesn't have so much power over the mind. Now the same three kinds of fabrication also apply to the path. That like when you're getting the mind in concentration, you've got the breath, which is bodily fabrication, and you've got directed thought and evaluation devoted to seeing how the breath can be made comfortable and how the mind can be made to stay with the breath. And then you have mental fabrication, the perceptions you have around the breath that help you hold, hold it in mind. Like you can perceive the breath. Not so much as the air coming in and out of the lungs, but the movement of energy in the body. And that allows the sense of ease to spread around. So when you learn about these processes of fabrication, it gives your effort some focus. You know exactly what to abandon and what to develop, how to take things apart if they're unskillful, how to create things, put them back together to make them skillful. All this you learn from having listened to the Buddha, listened to the Ajahns. And it's important that you listen to the Ajahns as well as the Buddha. There's some people who say, well, just go only by what's in the text and don't listen to anybody else. But the Buddha never meant for his text to be studied on their own. Back in his day, you couldn't read them at all. You had to listen to them from somebody. You learn them from another person, and you wanted to choose the person not only for the person's knowledge but also for the person's character and for the person's experience in putting those teachings into practice. That was the context in which the Buddha meant for his teaching to be passed down, because there are a lot of teachings that are, you can misunderstand, but if you see that a person who's put them into practice, you say, oh, this is how it's done. You can see which teaching takes priority at which time. And you pick up a lot of things that simply aren't there in the words. When the Buddha talks about the aspects of an admirable person, a person of integrity, a lot of the qualities, having a sense of time, having a sense of oneself, having a sense of moderation, having a sense of whom to associate with and whom not to. These are things that are not in the books. They have to be picked up by example. And even in meditation, there are a lot of things the Buddha tells you to do but doesn't say how. And so this is where it's good to learn from someone who has tried bringing those teachings into his or her mind. 
to see what works and what doesn't work. And it's to develop strategies for doing what the Buddha recommends. For example, the Buddha says when you're more focused on the breath, you try to breathe in a way that's comfortable, breathe in a way that gives rise to rapture. But it doesn't say how. When he talks about getting the mind into strong concentration, he says, try to gain a sense of ease and well-being and let it spread throughout the whole body so it permeates every part of the body. Now, if you hold a perception of the body and the mind that the body is just a big solid thing, it's going to be hard to spread ease through it. But if you think of it as being primarily breath energy and that the breath energy fills the whole body, then when there's a sense of ease with the breath, then it can spread easily because breath just spreads into breath. Now these are the strategies that John Lee developed by working at breath meditation. Without him, it would be hard to figure out what the text we're talking about, or hard to put the text into practice. So there's a lot we learn from trying to find people of integrity who practice the path and who know the ins and outs of the texts to know which teaching is applied at which time. And we have this background that our efforts are going to be well directed. That way our soldiers have good weapons. And they can strengthen the fortress. And at the same time they can Strengthen mindfulness so it's not so quick to let the enemy in. So, arm your efforts well. Because without them, there's no path. Without them, there's no end to suffering. The Buddha didn't teach just suffering. Some people accuse Buddhism of being pessimistic because it talks so much about suffering. But the Buddha is like a doctor. He talks about suffering because he has a cure. And the cure is not simply to watch things come and go on their own and accept that. The cure is to develop a path in the mind, develop good qualities in the mind so that suffering ends. If we simply sit there watching things coming and going, we're defeated. We can't do anything about it. If that's your attitude, it's a defeatist attitude. The Buddha was never a defeatist. The Buddha said his path was the unexcelled victory in battle. We are not just to accept things. We're here to find something we haven't seen before, know something we haven't known before, which requires that we do things we haven't done before. In other words, develop the skills of meditation so we can bring the end of suffering about through our desire, through our knowledge. Through the persistence of our efforts, 